You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is episode 25, so we've already almost halfway through our first year of podcasting. And this episode covers the week of May 2nd through May 6th, 2016. Uh, we had a, a general theme this week of uh, our, the assault of, uh, of political correctness on the South. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Just want to remind everyone that we've got our summer school coming up in June, June 12th through uh, 17th, 2016, in uh now, near Charleston, South Carolina. It's in uh, Seabrook Island, South Carolina. And uh, the topic, the Southern Tradition and the Renewal of America, a very positive program about what the South can offer for modern America and how that can actually lead to a better place, the Southern Tradition. Uh, most people would say the Southern Tradition has no currency in America because uh, it's simply an, an outmoded and outdated view of the world well, we see otherwise. We think otherwise at the Abbeville Institute. So we invite you to come out to the uh, to the summer school and learn what parts of the Southern tradition we can carry forward and, and how we can use those in the future to better America and better the South. And in some ways, uh, you know, we can, we can complain, and, and the pieces this week are, are going to talk about the PC attack on the South and how it's um, misguided, not only that, uh, hypocritical, but uh, we we sometimes we for, we lose sight of the of the positive things that the South can offer, and also in August. Now we haven't we haven't um, put this out there a hundred percent yet, but uh, August thirteenth it looks like we're going to have another conference in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. This one on nullification. So details are forthcoming. We've already got all of our speakers confirmed. We're just trying to firm up the date, but I think it's going to be August 13th. We don't have a, a price yet, but we know where it's going to be, and we know who's going to be there, and the topic is going to be nullification, and I don't think you want to miss this because it's not your standard talk about the theoretical underpinnings of nullification. There will be one talk, essentially, on that in relation to the Constitution, but the other talks are going to be about uh, how nullification can be used practically in the modern era and how to do it. And so there's going to be three legal experts there, which will be very interesting. And uh, we'll have a talk about uh, conventions and uh, also a talk uh, from one of the representatives of the Tenth Amendment Center about various uh, pieces of legislation and things that are going on and um, how states are looking to to enforce the Tenth Amendment. So um, this is an interesting conference. It's a, it's educational. It's also practical, though, and giving you a view about how things are done, how um, how legally things can be done to enforce the Tenth Amendment, and that's what nullification really is all about. So it's going to be a really good conference. I think that you're going to want to attend. So when we have more details on that, we'll probably have them by uh, uh, next week. Um, so you can mark your calendars and plan on being at our conference on nullification <clears throat> in August of 2016. And we're also going to have another conference in October, I believe, of 2016 as well. So uh, details will be forthcoming on that too. And that one's going to be in Texas. So we're coming out west bringing the show on the road out west, so uh, be looking for that, too. We'll have some information on that shortly. All right, so let's talk about the material we had up here for the week, and um, a lot of good stuff. The first piece was entitled Contextualizing American History, and it's by Philip Lee, and Mr. Lee has written a number of pieces. Now, most of the time, these go out in his, in his email list, and uh, so they're not exclusively written for us, but they're good. And in this particular piece... Um, He's talking about how he I'll read what he begins the piece with. He says, "Few, if any, current prominent historians voice unqualified objection to the destruction of Confederate monuments. The most tolerant among them insi instead suggests that the memorial should remain 
but with new explanatory inscriptions offering context, a code word that simplifies to south equals bad, north equals good. And so uh, there's some discussion about adding these contextual markers to just about everything in the south. So uh, no longer is it going to be a very laudatory or positive view of southern history. I mean, these, this is already happening in uh, various locations or the interpretations of various locations across the South, oftentimes to the uh, locations that are uh, related to the founding generation, whether it's uh, Jefferson's home, Madison's home, um, you know, Randolph's home. Uh, take your pick. Wherever you find a Southerner of any value to the American story, oftentimes their home is going to be reinterpreted or, quote-unquote, recontextualized to emphasize the fact that these particular people were slaveholders. And so that becomes the primary story, not their impact on American history, not how important they were for the fabric of the American story, which in so many ways is the Southern story. As we've said over and over again, the South is America. The Southern history is American history. Without the South, America doesn't exist. But this is what the left wants to do now. So they're not going to go ahead and say, all right, we're going to take these things down. We're just going to recontextualize them. We're going to reinterpret these things to uh, say that uh, these people were just a bunch of evil bigots. And so uh, we'll leave the monument up to make uh, the one side happy. Well, we didn't take your monument down, but we're going to talk about how bad these people actually were. And so that's a, that's a subtle way a backhanded way in so many ways to destroy the legacy of the South and the Southern tradition and important Southerners, many of whom were real American heroes. So it's a soft tyranny, so to speak. It's, uh, it's not taking stuff down or removing it entirely, uh, you know, purging it from the historical landscape. It's leaving it there, but saying, you know what, these people weren't very good people. But I don't find anyone doing that across the North. And that's exactly what Philip Lee and what some of the other pieces were talking about. We actually have two that talk about that and then two that talk about who is really responsible for this destruction, this cultural destruction in the South. And it's not often who you think it is. And that's the real issue. And so we'll talk about that. But uh, Mr. Lee gets into the fact that, well, you know, if we're going to do that, uh, maybe we should do this to the North, too. Maybe it should apply, as Mr. Lee says, to Yankee monuments. And he says, consider the Lincoln Memorial. A couple of months before he announced the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation on September 22, 1862, Lincoln met at the White House with African-American leaders and urged that blacks leave the country. He even arranged congressional funding for their emigration. Addressing his guests, Lincoln said, quote, You and we are of different races. We have existing between us broader differences than exist between almost any other two races. Whether it is right or wrong, I need not discuss, but this physical difference is, great, is a great disadvantage to us both. And I think your race suffer very greatly, many of them by living among us, while ours suffers from your presence. In a word, we suffer on each side. If this is admitted, it affords a reason at least why we should be separated. So here's Lincoln, the segregationist. Not just that, the colonizationist. And so when people talk about uh, segregation in the South, uh, they miss the point that those particular laws were often born in the North, that Northerners were segregating long before the South decided to do it. And I remember there was a, a history textbook that I used uh, at one point, and this was a very left-wing textbook, uh, and unfortunately, you can't really get a textbook that's not very left-wing anymore. This is a very left-wing textbook, and uh, it's uh, Goldfield is the editor of the book. And um, there was actually a chapter for the Reconstruction period, and it said, you know, one thing that has to be admitted about the South in the late 19th century is that it was segregated more by class than by race uh, before legal segregation, de jure segregation, took hold of the South in the late 19th century, essentially what you had in the South was a segregation by class. So it wasn't, it wasn't by race at all. 
And it wasn't until the late 19th century that you started seeing this, this legal segregation by race. Whereas you cannot say that in the North. Generally what you had in the North, uh, they didn't bring this up, but generally what you had in the North was segregation by race uh, because you had exclusionary laws and other things. And I'll talk about that in the next piece that we had on Tuesday. Uh, but you, you had, even into the 20th century, now it wasn't de jure segregation, meaning legal segregation. It was de facto segregation. And that still exists, in fact, even into the late 20th century. And I've seen uh, statistics for this uh, into the 1990s that the most segregated regions in the United States are still in the north. The most integrated regions in the United States are in the south. And if you think about it, that would make more sense because, of course, more African Americans live in the south. And so as, as things began to change in the South, as they moved away from uh, de jure segregation, um, the South just became much more integrated naturally in a lot of ways because that's what it is, right? And so this was the case oftentimes before you had Jim Crow legislation. And the, but the North stayed segregated because they had formed boroughs in these northern cities that still exist to this day. And... Um, so you had uh, segregation in northern states and northern cities, not by law but by fact. And uh, there was a an attempt when that was when there was an attempt to try to integrate in those areas. There was violent resistance to that, as I'll talk about in the next piece. But uh, so the North has is is complicit in all of this, um, and and fully guilty, just like the South. But we'll talk about why they can get away with that. And one of the other pieces. So, I mean, so there's a lot of, you know, all these pieces work together. And then, of course, uh, Lee brings up the fact that uh, some of the things that Lincoln had said in the Lincoln's Doug- Lincoln-Douglas debates where um, he uh, said, you know, for, for example, um, I am not nor have, I, or have ever been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes nor qualifying them to hold office nor to intermarry with white people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so Lincoln was not someone who believed in the equality of the races. And, of course, his Emancipation Proclamation was simply a, a, a military a, a, a proclamation of military expediency. He, he wanted to ensure that the North would win the war. And one part of the proclamation, you know, he preliminarily issued this proclamation. But what he did in that was say, look, if you'll lay down your arms and you come back in the Union, I won't enforce this proclamation, meaning that slavery would stay. A lot of people don't think about that when they think about the proclamation. Lincoln was willing to say, yeah, if y'all just lay down your arms right now, slavery will stay. And the South didn't do it. Uh, So it's interesting how all these little nuances work out. Uh, and, of course, one of the things that people feared with, with the proclamations would lead to a slave insurrection. So Lincoln added uh, a little rider to the, to the official proclamation on January 1, 1863, that tried to curtail that, to say he doesn't agree with that. Um, but Lee concludes, he says, But if context must be added to Confederate monuments, let's add it to the historical memorials on each side, including our common country's greatest president, Abraham Lincoln. So this is where we're at, I think. And um, I think there are people that will be willing to do this. There are people that view the entire fabric of American history as racist, and it all needs to be contextualized or taken down or changed, and that really American history doesn't start until maybe the late 1970s. And uh, people will be surprised, I think, in the future. The South is a low-hanging fruit. It really is. I mean, it's easy to pick off the South. Southern symbols, low-hanging fruit, and I, I don't harbor any illusions. I think that more and more Southern symbols are going to be taken down, uh, removed from public spaces. It's going to happen. And I'm not even certain if they're going to survive in museums or in history texts, history classrooms. I'm not certain if they're going to survive there. I think the only place that these symbols are going to survive ultimately in the story of the South really is in the home. And for now, I I think that's going to happen. And how long, how long it will lay under the surface 
and how long people will hold on to it is unknown. Um, if it will ever come back. I mean, this is what the Institute is about, though, to try to, to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition and get people to hang on to that. And, uh, you know, as long as people hang on to their traditions at home and they keep talking about them at home, then they'll, they'll be perpetual. But um, there, is a, there is a push to not even do that anymore. So we'll see how long it takes. Uh, but I, 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 don't, I don't think uh, this thing is going to wane anytime soon. And uh, this this attack on Southern symbols, and uh, which really is an attack on the entire fabric of the United States and the principles of Jefferson, the Jeffersonian tradition. I mean, that's what's under assault. And, and people are fully aware of this. Uh, because when you remove this last vestige of what, you know, we talked about this a, a couple of weeks ago, dissidents, which is what Confederate symbols are, they're dissident. They're thumbing their nose at the central government and the empire. When you remove that, I mean, you can say, well, we love the American War for Independence, but people don't often equate that with dissidence, which is what it was. I mean, it is the Jeffersonian tradition of independence and self-determination. That's what you celebrate when you celebrate the Declaration and you celebrate the American War for Independence. That's what you're doing. It has to remember that the British said that that particular war was for slaveholders. Nobody often realizes that, but the British were often saying during that war, well, this is all about people wanting to hold on to their slaves. Well, we, we don't say that anymore because Northerners were partaking in that particular war too, so they can't say that. Uh, well, no, 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 they'll say, no, it wasn't, it wasn't for that, because we're partaking in that war. But if we're not in that war, then it's all about whatever we want to say it's about. Um. So it's interesting, you know, two wars of self-determination, one is portrayed differently than the other. And uh, I, I'm not certain that there will ever be a connection between the two, you know, anymore, writ large, among the American population, saying that these two wars are similar. Because all we're going to do is look at cause, which, as historians, even, you know, people like James McPherson have pointed out, He's no, he's no Southern apologist that the cause at which most Southerners fought was not slavery. It was for independence. It was, uh, now, they do say they were fighting against slavery. He does say they're fighting against slavery, their own slavery. That's what they wrote about a lot. We're not going to be enslaved by the North. So, uh, and, and as we've mentioned before in conferences and other things, if you look at the monuments that were produced after the war, they mention self-determination, the principles of self-determination, the, the true principles of the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera. And so at its core, Southerners were fighting for that original interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, and I, I think that you can't get around that. You can't get around it. Uh, they had opportunities to come back in the Union even right away with something like the Corwin Amendment already passing through the Congress and say, look, you can... You can keep slavery forever. It would be well protected. And yet they didn't come back in the Union because they wanted self-determination. And it had been threatened over and over again in American history as early as 1794, not by the South, but by the North. 1794, only you know six years after the Constitution has been ratified. And if you look at the original Union, 1781, only 13 years after the original Union was put together, and the Articles of Confederation, you already have northern states mentioning they want to secede from the Union. And why would they want to do that? Well, because they didn't believe that their interests were protected by this Union, that the South dominated it, and they just wanted out. And so really when you start looking at secession and self-determination, and you start talking about this idea in American history... If you want to contextualize anything, well, then really talk about what self-determination was and how that was the American spirit uh, that the South hung on to the longest and, of course, promoted the longest and did it more effectively than anyone else. All right, so the next piece on Tuesday is written by yours truly, is white supremacy and exclusively Southern ideology. And uh, if you listen to the mainstream press, you'd think it was. It's only Southerners uh, that uh, have ever espoused any type of white supremacy. Of course, we just talked about the, the Philip Lee piece, which showed that's not exactly true. 
and uh, there was a white, quote unquote, white supremacist rally that had five people show up at Stone Mountain uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, judging by the pictures, there were like five people there waving newly, newly bought, newly purchased Confederate battle flags. And uh, then you had a bunch of knucklehead protesters. These knuckleheads were there doing this. And then you had a bunch of knucklehead protesters show up. So you had two groups of knuckleheads there, and you had to have the police called in, and there was a riot and other things. So, uh, but the the message was clear that the battle flag in southern the southern tradition is exclusively about white supremacy and hate and white power. Uh, this is a southern trait, exclusively southern trait. The North had nothing to do with this. There's nothing about the North that uh, ever smacked of white supremacy. Uh, but in fact, I think that white supremacy had more of a home in the North than it ever did in the South. And people pointed this out in the antebellum period over and over and over again. They openly pointed this out uh, in during the war. And so, you know, we, we have to start saying, look, were, were Southerners racist in the antebellum period? Absolutely. So were Northerners. No, no more than Northerners. In fact, you know, Northerners were were viciously racist. Were Southerners racist after the war? Yes. Were Northerners racist after the war? Yes. Did Southerners consider blacks to be inferior? Yes. Did Northerners consider blacks to be inferior? Yes. In fact, racism as we understand it today, that term racism, was an American trait for most of American history. It's not a Southern trait. And there are plenty of examples out there about this. But the problem is, it's easier to demonize the South, again, again because it's the low-hanging fruit, uh, than to say the North was complicit in this, and in fact held on to it too for a long time into the 20th century. And uh, this is what uh, has been called the treasury of, of uh, counterfeit virtue. Right? Uh, and in the last piece, the Friday piece, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, uh, Dr. Devaney, John Devaney, does a nice job of pointing this out in his very literary way. Uh, so there are plenty of examples, and I'm not going to go through all these, or really, because you can go to the piece and read it. Uh, but, you know, from prominent Northerners who talked about uh, the North being the land for the Anglo-Saxon race, uh, David Wilmot, the famous Wilmot Proviso, for those that don't know a lot about American history, and maybe you've never heard, I hope you've heard of the Wilmot Proviso before, but during the war with Mexico, when it became clear the United States was going to win the war and acquire territory, David Wilmot of Pennsylvania attached a rider to a military spending bill, which would have prohibited slavery in the newly acquired territory. And this created a firestorm of protest. But Wilmot's reasoning for it, he said very succinctly, it was, quote, the cause and the rights of the white freemen, and I would preserve to free white labor a fair country, a rich inheritance where the sons of toil of my own race and own color can live without the disgrace which association with Negro slavery brings upon free labor. And then he wrote privately, by God, sir, men born and nursed of white women are not to be ruled by men who were brought up on the milk of some damn Negro wench. Uh, Jacob Brinkerhoff, who was an Ohio Democrat, talking about the Wilmot Proviso, said, quote, I have selfishness enough greatly to prefer the welfare of my own race to that of any other, and vindictiveness enough to wish to keep in the South the burden which they themselves created, which, of course, he meant black slavery and a large population of black Americans. So he didn't want black people to be in this territory because it would pollute the territory. Uh, another Ohio Democrat at the revision of the state constitution in Ohio in 1850 said, quote, The United States were designed by God in heaven to be governed and inhabited by the Anglo-Saxon race and by them alone. Blacks were very little removed from the condition of dumb beasts. They wallowed in the mire like hogs, and there was nothing of civilization in their aboriginal conditions. Quote, end quote. So that's William Sawyer of Ohio saying that in 1850. Seward, Lincoln's Secretary of State, said that blacks were a foreign and feeble element, like the Indian, incapable of assimilation, and unwisely and unnecessarily transplanted to our fields. 
Ohio Republicans. See, this is often said, well, that was just the racist Democrats in the North. But this wasn't true. A Ohio or an, an Ohio Republican said this. He urged Democrats to stop shouting, quote, shouting Sambo at us. We have no Sambo in our platform. We object to Sambo. We don't want him about. We insist that he shall not be forced upon us. Republican Party, he claimed, was created for the benefit of the white race alone. Lyman Trumbull of Illinois said, quote, in 1859, quote, We, the Republican Party, are the white man's party. We are for the free white men and for making white labor acceptable and honorable, which it can never be when Negro slave labor is brought into competition with it. A Kansan writing in the New York Tribune in 1855 summarized the sentiment of most northern Republicans and Democrats when he wrote, quote, First, then be not deceived in the character of the anti-slavery feeling. Many who are known as free state men are not anti-slavery in our northern exception of the word. They are more properly, properly Negro haters who vote free state to keep Negroes out, free or slave. One half of them would go for slavery if Negroes were allowed to be here at all. The inherent sinfulness of slavery is not one thought by them. One third of the Free State Party is made up of men who, would, who act from convictions of conscience. The remaining two thirds are Free State men from conviction that the profits of freedom derivable in the shape of customers would be greater than if slavery existed. So it's practical, and they don't want black people around. Even during the war, Union soldiers talked about how they were not fighting for blacks. And again, I've produced some quotes there for that. One of the more ardent racist white supremacists in the history of uh, Ameri in American history, his name was uh, Dr. J.H. Van Every. He was from New York. He had a newspaper entitled The Caucasian. During the war, he said this, quote, The equality of all whom God has created equal, white men, and the inequality of those he has made unequal, Negroes and other inferior races, are the cornerstone of American democracy and the vital principle of American civilization and human progress. We should announce that the, gra that the grand humanitarian policy of progressive and civilized America is to restore subgenation all over the American continent. End quote. He's from New York, and he's saying that the cornerstone of American democracy is white supremacy. Now, he's not from the South, and he's making a cornerstone speech. <gasps> but, of course, no one ever talks about this. This is a guy who had a quite a large following in New York saying these things. In all Midwestern states in the 1850s, referendums extending voting rights to blacks were defeated by crushing majorities. In several of these states, blacks were not allowed to establish residency. This was commonplace. Even Northeastern states adopted harsh policies toward blacks before the war. Many of these policies had waned by the 1850s, but their legacy ensured that the free black population of New England would remain low for most of its history. Massachusetts prescribed whipping for any non-resident free black who stayed in the state longer than two months. Connecticut denied blacks residency in the colonial period. There were strict policies regarding black property ownership in all New England states in the colonial period, and free blacks had to carry passives to travel. Even into the 1850s, Pennsylvania debated allowing free blacks to settle in the state. It must also be said that free black Southerners could vote in, in southern colonies and some southern states into the early 19th century. Now, that was restricted by the 19th century, but before that point, they could. The same was not true for the North. Black Northerners could not vote in 19 of 24 northern states at the end of the war in 1865, and before 1860, northern blacks could not serve on juries. In fact, Alexis de Tocqueville described the situation for black northerners as thus in his democracy in America. He said, quote, So the Negro in the north is free, but he cannot share the rights, pleasures, labors, griefs, or even the tomb of whom whose equal he has been declared. There is nowhere where he can meet him either in life nor in death. And of course, while the situation did improve in the North after the war, I mean, it has to be said, the laws restricting these type of things were taken off the books, but it didn't mean that things necessarily got that much better. In fact, 
it has to be mentioned that the Klan in the 1920s, which is the high point of the Klan, right? The Klan, uh, you had the original Klan, which was theoretically disbanded about the end of Reconstruction uh, in the 1860s in many southern states. Um, you had the second Klan revived in the early 20th century. And this particular Klan, the second Klan, was the most powerful Klan in the history of the organization. And it found favor all over the United States. In fact, uh, you would not find a Confederate battle flag at any particular Klan rally in any picture that you've ever seen. And I say it had acceptance all over the United States. One of the great heroes of the left, Margaret Sanger, uh, spoke at Klan rallies. Uh, so there's a picture of her out there speaking at a Klan rally, uh, and she wrote about it. So, you know, this organization was accepted across the North. Uh, there was actually a show that HBO produced, and it was um, very violent and uh, not always uh, good uh, quality entertainment in terms of the imagery. But it was a Boardwalk Empire, and it was about uh, the illegal um, alcohol activities in Atlantic City during Prohibition. And it uh, one of the things they did very well in the show was bring in pieces of the 1920s and pieces of history and bring it into the show – and they showed a very interesting point where there's a campaign going on and how uh, the politicians in New Jersey would, on one hand, go to a, a black gathering and talk about what they're going to do for black Americans and then sit and participate in a political rally at the, for the Klan and say the exact same things. The Klan and how they would openly, the Klan would openly walk around in the north in their, in their uniforms, their hoods and their sheets. And uh, this was an acceptable political organization in the North. And there was a very famous rally in Washington, D.C. in 1925 where you had the Klan march there. And you would not find anything but a U.S. flag. And in, in fact, the U.S. flag was the only flag the second Klan flew. And that's because the Klan said that their America was a progressive, was a progressive America, uh, America they wanted, not a South, but they wanted an America free of black Americans. This is a progressive America to them. The Klan was progressive. And people have written about this. They advocated things that progressives wanted, just without any black Americans taking part. And the, the last Grand Wizard of the 1920s Klan was from Indiana. And when he was convicted of rape, and the governor of Indiana, who was his friend, refused to bail him out, he exposed all the Klan members in Indiana, many of whom were Republicans in the state. Some of the most heinous lynchings took place in uh, the North. Uh, Will, the lynching of Will Brown in Omaha, Nebraska in 1919 was a brutal lynching. I mean, this thing was awful. The guy was dragged out of a jail, beaten, hung, shot, burned to death. This is a series of riots that took place in 1919 across the North called the Red Summer Race Riots. It's where um, you had uh, some of the more famous literary figures of the Harlem Renaissance writing poetry and stories about, um, uh, there was a very famous poet, Claude McKay, who, was, who wrote a poem, If We Must Die, and it was about these Red Summer race riots. Uh, one of the more uh, famous or infamous pictures of a lynching in American history, the lynching of Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith, was taken in Indiana in 1930. Uh, it's a horrible picture. You have two men who have been lynched, and there's a, a big crowd standing under the tree where they were lynched, and a man pointing to the to the uh, two to ship and, Abr and uh, Abram Smith. This was in Indiana in 1930. The worst race riots in the middle of the 20th century, 1968, after the assassination of King, were in Chicago and Detroit, not in southern cities. Uh, race riots broke out in Boston in the 1970s over forced busing. And in fact, the most iconic image from a 1976 Boston race riot was of a white Bostonian beating an unarmed, an unarmed black attorney with a U.S. flag. Now, I've never seen any picture of a Confederate flag being used as a physical weapon against black Americans, but it, the U.S. flag was used that way. So, of course, you could say, well, uh, you can reasonably claim that the U.S. flag in these cases was taken out of context. The meaning's been hijacked by the Klan and other northern racists. I mean, you can reasonably say that. Well, I mean, but that's not the flag. That's not, that's not the meaning of the flag, the U.S. flag that I support. That's not what it means to me. It means something else to me. 
Okay, I mean, you can reasonably say that. Sure. I mean, you can say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a member of the Klan. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that America. I believe in tolerance. Okay, you can say that. I mean, the U.S. flags for independence, for liberty, for these things, it means that to me. That's what it means to me. Some admit even that the flag flew over slavery longer than it did in the South. I mean, 90 years. But because the flag represents something else to most Americans today, it should not be viewed as a symbol of hate. I mean, you can reasonably say that. But of course, isn't it ironic? That's the exact same thing people in the South today say about the Confederate battle flag. To most Southerners who fly that flag, the meaning has been distorted, abused, and stolen by white supremacist groups like those who showed up at Stone Mountain. And there was, a, because the Olympics are in Brazil this summer, there was an interesting uh, piece that came out not long ago, and they went down, you know, every April in Brazil, they have the Confederado uh, rally in Brazil at the end of the month. And uh, they interviewed some of these Brazilians who love the flag. I mean, they fly it all up. This British reporter goes down there and says, don't you know that flag's about hate? And the leader of this uh, group of Confederados said, what are you talking about? To us, that flag is, is a symbol of love. This is what he said, his actual words, quote, a symbol of love meaning love for his family, its traditions and history, and its people. That's what you'd find among the, I mean, I'm talking 99.9% .9 of Southerners who fly that flag. That's what it means to them as a symbol of love. And to other Americans, of course, you know, it means things like self-determination, the Jeffersonian tradition of self-government, resistance to tyranny. These are distinct, this is a distinctly American tradition. So, the battle flag was flown in Europe in the waning days of the Cold War as resistance to the Soviet bloc. Uh, a modified form has been used by leaders of the Ukrainian separatist movement today. I mean, this is what people view it as. It's either self-determination or a symbol of love. Not these kooks that were up there at Stone Mountain. They've hijacked it. They've stolen it. And so if you can say that the Klan of the 1920s did that with the U.S. flag, if you can say that uh, that's not my U.S. flag, and I agree, well then why, why is the same principle not, apply, not, not applied to people who fly the Confederate battle flag today? Or who, who love that flag or love uh, their people? And it was also pointed out uh, that uh, in this particular piece, that, you know, hate's not the accurate word. It's an incorrect word to describe relationships between white and black Southerners, particularly before the war. Superiority, yes. I mean, there's no, there's no getting around the fact that white, you know, white Southerners didn't think black Southerners were equal. But there was a common history with white and black Southerners. This is the great tragedy of Southern history. White and black Southerners have lived together for 400 years. And there's a common history there, a commonality. They're both Southern. Even uh, another mainstream historian, Jennifer Weber, pointed out in her book on Northern Copperheads, quote, no prominent Copperheads ever discussed or even acknowledged the fact that racial mixing was well established in American life, having taken place for generations on Southern plantations. This is true. In fact, Northern Republicans labeled the Democrat Party the mulatto democracy because they believed Democrats favored, quote, bleaching the darkies. The best blood of the democracy ran in the veins of the peculiar property. And, of course, the free black population of the South was much larger than that of the North, even though the northern population counting the Midwestern states was nearly twice the size of the South, and many of these free people of color were mulattoes. And so you have this commonality, this common history. Unfortunately, it was not always pretty or peaceful. and it was, Again, it was brutally violent at times, and that's unfortunate. But there was a familiarity there that... Northerners which to avoid. And de Tocqueville, again, writing in his Democracy in America, talked about this. He said, quote, In the South, where slavery still exists, less trouble is taken to keep the Negro apart. They sometimes share the labors and the pleasures of the white men. People are prepared to mix with them to some extent. Legislation is more harsh against them, but customs are more tolerant and gentle. This is why Booker T. Washington could urge in 1895 white and black Southerners to cast down your buckets where you are to work together because they had worked together for their common history for 200 years at that point.
Eugene Genovese wrote in his Roll Jordan Roll that, quote, black and white, blacks and whites in America may be viewed as one nation or two or as a nation within a nation, but their common history guarantees that one way or another they are both American. And Genovese was correct about this, but he missed a point. They're not only both American, they're both Southern. And this is why many blacks are moving back to the South after years in the North, because the South is home. The South is home. And white and blacks in the South have long been around each other and gotten along as we pointed out in countless articles on this website, gotten along more than they didn't. Were there problems? Was there a disconnect in terms of superiority or quality or these terms that are often thrown around? Absolutely. Often violent problems. But we forget the long history, the mutual history of white and black Southerners. And and a lot of issues, white and black Southerners are a lot closer on things than white northerners and white southerners or black northerners and black southerners on a lot of issues so that's if we want racial reconciliation we want to heal that's what we need to talk about not just the bad and the ugly in the south but the good because that's how you start getting people to find common ground hey we've got a long history together let's work together let's cast down our buckets where we are there's no hate there. There's suspicion. There was a time, you know, su- uh, superiority. But that's not an exclusively Southern trait, as this article pointed out over and over again. And if we're going to start recontextualizing things, as Philip Lee said, maybe we should start by renaming Yale or Brown University. Maybe we should start uh, renaming Fennel Hall. Maybe we should remove the Lyman Trumbull statue from the Illinois State House, or furl the U.S. flag. Because after all, it was used as a symbol of hate. Or maybe we need to recontextualize the Lincoln Memorial, as uh, Philip Lee said, and of course this piece says too. Where Lincoln also says, I am in favor of the race to which I belong, having the superior position. For those who don't need an explanation, that is white supremacy. Of course, we're not going to do that. The low-hanging fruit's under attack. But I, I say again, it won't be long before the other stuff is under attack too. So on Wednesday, we had another piece, really short piece by, uh, by Clyde Wilson. It's Shades of John Brown, and it talks about this 1904 event that took place in Kansas uh, where a woman named uh, Blanche Boys entered the Kansas State Capitol with an axe concealed under her cloak, and then she rode the elevator to the fifth floor of the headquarters of the Kansas Historical Society and chopped up a large picture of Custer's Last Stand or Custer's Last Fight, as often called. This was a propaganda piece for Anheuser-Busch. Uh, It was a painting that was in practically every bar in America. And so she chops up the painting, and they ask her, what are you doing? And she said, quote, I concluded to chop the name of that secesh firm off with no ill will toward the rest of the picture. Uh, So she is equating Anheuser-Busch, which was probably, uh, you know, Germans, who probably didn't support secession to begin with, uh, with, uh, you know, secession. And uh, (laughs) so she's associating beer with the Confederacy. Uh, so you have this still in 1904, this hatred, this, I mean, axing, uh, you know, chopping up uh, this this painting because it's secesh. Of course, that's exactly what John Brown did, Nathan, <laughs> quote unquote, bleeding Kansas. But just a few years later, you know, Confederate and Union veterans got together, cordial in the field of Gettysburg, shook hands, took pictures together. But here you have this woman, 1904, chopping up a painting because those seceshes were behind it. But yet the real veterans, the people that shot at each other, the people that wanted to kill each other, can get on the field and shake hands and say, you know what, Johnny Reb, you know what, Billy Yank, it's okay. It's okay. But it wasn't okay for a lot of people, and it's still not okay. When the veterans can shake hands and say, you know what, we don't mind your symbols, we don't mind your statues, we, we honor your symbols and your statues, even the, um, the largest union veteran organization in the country has come out and said, we we support Confederate symbols and Confederate statues. We support those things. But yet, for some reason, other people don't. Uh, I mean, it just goes to show you that the people, the real people that mattered, buried the hatchet. Even U.S. presidents were pictured in front of battle flags. and All the way up to John F. Kennedy. Didn't have a problem with it. Uh, on Thursday, we ran a piece by Alphonse Louis Vin. Uh, who's a Vietnamese immigrant, 
his parents moved here 60 years ago, but he's a full-fledged Southerner. He considered himself to be a Southerner, uh, not born in the South, but he's become a Southerner, and uh, he loves the South. And um, he he talks about how he's d- disappointed because the real problem is that Southern history is not being taught, and he's right. He's right. And he says, quote, demographics are against us in the South. We have millions of people living here who don't have Southern roots nor seek to acquire any. There are people living here because they have either lucrative careers or decent paying jobs below the Mason-Dixon line. These newcomers know nothing about the Southern tradition, and quite often they're hostile to what they understand to be the Southern tradition. Ditto for brainwashed native Southerners. And here is the point. Native Southerners, as the next piece is going to talk about. Since Southern schools teach nothing that's sympathetic about the traditional South nor its Confederate heritage, we must find powerful educational alternatives to reach out to the new generations who are ignorant of their past, whether they are Southerners who people have lived here for centuries, or offspring, such as I, of Vietnamese immigrant parents who originally came here 60 years ago. It doesn't matter. They should all be Southernified. We have no future as a distinctive culture otherwise. This is a problem that Southerners pointed out in the 1880s. I mean, Southern history is already not being taught then, in the 1880s. And here we are, you know, over 120 years later, still not being taught. He says, years ago, I once gave a keynote address to the annual meeting of the Jeb Stewart Society in Richmond. I spoke from the pulpit of St. Paul's Episcopal Church, where Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee attended services. Their seats were marked for visitors to see. My speech was about the necessity to restore the, to Virginia schools a genuine education in Virginia history. Now under the new rector of, his, uh, of historic St. Paul's, <clears throat> every vestige of the Confederacy has been removed, including the nameplates where Southern heroes once kneeled at prayer. The rector is from old Southern stock. His ancestors fought as officers for the Confederacy. He was a very kind and amiable young man. Yet he represents a new generation of elite Southerners who've joined the gigantic chorus of those who seek to eradicate the Southern heritage all in the name of progress and tolerance. And this is exactly, again, he's a native Southerner. Progressive intolerance is left for everything that's part of the old Southern heritage. Since, according to the American left, we're hateful, racist, sexist, and homophobic. For my friends who received my news on the tragic state of affairs regarding the insane political correctness of my alma mater, Yale, and also the desired plan to remove the name of John C. Calhoun from the college named after him, I have a sad update. Yale has removed all of Calhoun's portraits from his college. So the portrait of John C. Calhoun that once hung over the fireplace of Calhoun's college dining hall is no more. I used to dine there with friends who were Calhounites. It would be strange to dine in this new Calhoun College where the portrait of one of the college's Patrons is now nowhere to be found. The privileged young people who eat there every day don't care. Indeed, they are happy not to see the white supremacist face of the great nullificator. These Calhoun College undergraduates have no appreciation of Yale's long and rich heritage. Furthermore, they don't care, preferring to join with the radical faculty and administration to eliminate history. Indeed, the millennial undergraduates were the ones who frightened their cravenly crowd professors a coward professors and administrators to bend to their will. John C. Calhoun was a great man with major accomplishments. He was a devoted Yalee and a great thinker, one of America's greatest political philosophers. And yet, because John C. Calhoun was an antebellum Southern slaveholder and an illustrious member of the elite planter class, denies him of his undergraduate greatness, an undeniable greatness, excuse me, one of the first things that totalitarian governments do upon seizing power is to eliminate history, installing their own fictions upon a gullible new generation and those to follow. True history is never about false indoctrination. However, in order to permanently fetter minds, you need to indoctrinate, not educate. And so he concludes, I remember what, that wonderful line from Gone with the Wind, Scarlet, this is not to be born. And yet, and yes, let us pray hard to God, not only for our own redemption, but also for the, that of those who hate our culture and heritage. And so, Mr. Dr. Venn points out a couple of interesting things there. It's not necessarily the North that's the problem. It's, it's people around, white Southerners. And Dr. John Devaney talks about this in the Friday piece, Secession of the Heart, and he says, 
the problem really is the duplicity endemic in much of the South that is far worse than moonlight magnolias and disparagement. Here he says, I speak of duplicity as unfaithfulness. The current rage to face and remove all Confederate memory from, memory from the South, be it monument, flag, or song, has brought this sort of unfaithfulness to light in an especially ugly and vulgar manner. Here I do not speak of certain dens, denizens of greater New England and the left coast. How well Robert Penn Warren captured them when he wrote, quote, The northerner with his treasury of virtue feels redeemed by history, automatically redeemed. He has in his pocket not a papal indulgence peddled by some wandering partner of the Middle Ages, but an indulgence, a plenary indulgence, for all sins past, present, and future, freely given by the hand of history. Perhaps Mr. Warren, Dr. Devaney says, understood the situation. Many of the sons and daughters of Greater New England view themselves not only as redeemed, but as the redeemers. It is in their purview to change all existing standards of morality, to make pronouncement upon secular heresies and apostate, and to excommunicate to the outer, outer darkness all who might dare question their dictates. These people need the South, he says, or rather the character of the South, desperately. Like the Puritan of old, they must have a devil's army to fight in the wilderness to affirm them in their sense of mission. A mission, by the way, which will never have an end. There is an elect, and they are it. And there exists a damned, and we well know who they are. This can never change, for the moral universe is a predestined one. The damned shall, shall have no share with the elect. The wizard's apprentice in this black magic show is the unfaithful one, the good southerner. So the good southerner becomes the tool of these treasury of virtue New Englanders. He calls this person the good southerner. The good southerner has much in common with his cousin, the good Indian. The good Indian was the Native American who agreed to settle his wandering ways and adopt the ways of the European. During the wars on the plains, the good Indian stayed on the reservation, learned to farm, occasionally scouted for the U.S. Cavalry, and for his efforts received spoiled rations, whiskey, and a Henry rifle. His less good countrymen held him in suspicion and contempt for abandoning the path of his fathers. The trap the good Indian found himself in was truly pathetic. No matter high, how high he rose on the ladder of civilization, no matter how he was to the white masters, he remained an Indian. Phil Sheridan, the maker of war upon women and children in Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, captured the predicament quite well. He said, quote, the only good Indians I ever saw were dead. The good Southerner is a more sinister and less sympathetic type. He adopts a simplistic moral vision of his culture and imperator and condemns any and all things that his betters condemn. If the northern myth of the war must replace the southern myth of the war, then so be it. And the truth be damned. If the monuments are to come down, the flags forever furled, and the songs effaced, then to it, man! Our ancestors were villains, and the moral imperators must be appeased. But of course, they shall never be appeased. Be appeased. The elect are always in need of the damned in order to be affirmed. The good southerner, he says, duplicity lay in his unfaithfulness. He cares not a whit about the half truths and, and detractions hurled at his ancestors or for the distortion of history. There is money to be made, foreign industry to attract, basketball tournaments to host, bowl games to sponsor. His ancestors who are deserving of pietas for their virtues and achievements and understanding and forgiveness for their sins and defects, for whom among us was without sin, instead have been dishonored. The South was once together with Ireland the last non-material civilization in the West. Now it has certain sons and daughters more willing, more than willing to put the patrimony up for sale, for it is always about money and power, with the secular Puritan and the good Southerner on the make. The good Southerner, he says, is the ultimate secessionist, for he has undertaken a secession of the heart. He is less, less pathetic and more sinister because he not only allows his enemy to define him, he welcomes this alienation as a sign of redemption and acceptance. He no longer remembers who he is and is happy for his ignorance of an alienation from the history and his culture. He has become like the character... Rex Motram from Bride's Head Revisited, not a complete man at all, just the bits and pieces of one. The rest traded for pottage. 
So it's not Northerners that are the problem. They're always going to be there. It's white Southerners who have accepted the Northern interpretation of history and who just say, look, we're going to agree with whatever they say. We're just going to go along to get along. We're going to find acceptance in them. And that's not what their ancestors cared about or wanted. They didn't want acceptance from them. They wanted independence from them. And we see that all across the South today. Just accept us. We're going to bow to whatever you say. Just accept us. Accept us. And we never will be accepted because there will always be another purge, always another thing that has to come down, always something else that has to be recontextualized or changed. There will always be something more. It is a never-ending cultural war. And the Puritan is never satisfied. The Northerner is never satisfied with his attempts to change society. There will always need change. There's nothing permanent about it. There's something to purify. Something has to be purified. Someone is in need of purification for whatever sin. And so all through this week, we talked about this. How the North has no treasury of virtue. They don't have it. They never had it. How this attack on the South will have no end. And how it's important that real Southern history is taught. And that Southerners remember who they are. As Mel Bradford said, remembering who we are. And if we do that, and that's why we're here. That's why the Abbeville Institute exists. If we do that, if we can do that in our families, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, this is not going to be over anytime soon. It may come down to the fact that it's only in our families that we have these things any longer, that we have pride in who we were as a people at one time. It's who Southerners were as a people, just like the Irish have pride in who they are as a people. People all over the world are allowed to have pride in who they are as a people, except in the South. It's the, it's the great mystery of things. You can't have pride in it in the South. You have to be told that you're wrong. Or it's quaint and funny. But for many people, it's not quaint and funny. It's their people. It's their family they're talking about. And that's why they fight so hard for it. And I think that's hard for people to understand, people who are dislocated and have no respect for that. But for many Southerners, that family, that tie still matters. And that's why they're willing to defend this stuff, defend Southern symbols and Southern culture and Southern history, and the Southern tradition, which really is the American tradition. That's why they're willing to do it. And that's why we exist. And remember, all of these pieces that we talked about this week, it's all... <laughs> We exist on your donations. These people are doing this because they want to, not because they're making a tremendous amount of money doing this. All the conferences we do, all the things we do, we appreciate your contributions. They're fully, uh, uh, they're tax deductible to the full extent of the law. So please consider helping us out. Fifty bucks, less than less than four dollars. I'm sorry, less than five dollars a month. Fifty bucks can get you a membership to the institute. That'd be great. We 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 can use your help. Keep the website going. Keep the podcast going. Keep the conferences going. All of these things that are important, the Southern tradition that's so important. And if you can do that, that Southern tradition can remain alive. Until next time, good day.